Okay, if everybody can take their seats, we're running a bit behind time. Excellent. If everybody can take their seats, we'll get going. Congratulations for making it this far. Uh, we're really uh, in the home stretch now, and uh, you know, I'm, sh I I'm sure you're uh, a bit overwhelmed by all the information which has come through. And what we're hoping to do—we're not going to achieve it in this session—but what we're hoping to do is distill some of the things that have come out of the discussions. And really, we've been taking a future back we've been thinking about this, this future which we could wish to achieve, but now we have to think much more concretely. We have to move from thinking to acting, and what are the ways in which we can move forward? So we have four fantastic speakers, uh, and we're going to use, in many cases, their first-hand experience of actually shifting the system where they work, and try then to see the implications of that experience for um, what we've been talking about over the last, uh, last day and a half. Um, and I think we're going to have four very different perspectives. Um, the, first, uh, the first speaker is uh, uh, Luis Miguel uh, Gutierrez Robledo. Um, Luis, uh, so we're each, of the, each of these uh, speakers, are go it's going to be a little bit different than the earlier sessions because they have 15 minutes. We've asked them really to be uh, a bit free-flowing and ambitious, um, but they only have 15 minutes and they're allowed to use PowerPoints. So not all of them are using them, but they're allowed to use them. So this is, we, we thought we'd try and liven things up for the last session. Uh, so Luis Miguel um, uh, served on the faculty of the National University of the Mexico School of Geriatrics. Uh, he was head of the Geriatric Medicine Specialty Program, and he founded the Department of Geriatrics at the National Institute of Medical uh, Sciences in Mexico. And he's actually been the head since 2009. And I know he's worked very closely with the government in Mexico in implementing what has been a very ambitious program there. So Luis Miguel, I'll, I'll pass to you first. Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. So uh, if I had, let me just, <laughs> timer, okay. If I, if I had a magic wand, what would I envision for uh, a system of health and well-being for all? May, may we see uh, my, oh, my slides? Yeah, it's there, but it's not here. It's not here. It's all right. You'll find yourself. You're losing time. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, it starts now. Uh, so what is my vision? Health will be defined holistically as an overall state of well-being encompassing mental, social, emotional, functional, and spiritual health. We will have access to detailed information about our own function. We will own our health data, and that is key. Healthcare will be centered on persons empowered to improve function rather than seek treatment. We will receive personalized health solutions in ways that are integrated seamlessly into our daily lives. And all of this will be enabled by data and AI provided within a healthcare system that is organized and regulated in an entirely different way. Some resources and principles that would be needed. Aging as a resources, aging as an opportunity, innovation and technology advances, new professions and skills in health. Two key paradigm shifts, recognizing the malleability of aging and moving away from age towards intrinsic capacity. Second, a paradigm not centered in the hospital and rather towards wellness and function, preventing disability rather than disease. Exploit and invest in new technologies, optimizing health and social care for all the issue of inequity universal health care with equity in access, value-based, a life course perspective, and a strong focus on the new issues that will be raised from the bioethical field. 
by all those upheavals. There are many mega trends which are now uh, menacing the uh, performance of health systems around the world. And I would like to focus in two particular ones. Well, in fact, we have, we have been uh, dealing uh, all these uh, this two days about the unequal distribution of resources, the issue of inequity, uh, difficulty in access to, to health care for many individuals. And, but I, well, I would like to focus in another, in another issue, industry pressures. In fact, we have not yet talked about it. And uh, the, the, the distrustful consumer how uh, the consumer is behaving now fa in face of these uh, changes. Uh, pandemics, well, <laughs> we are in the middle of, of, of one uh, big pandemic, and we, I, I think I will have to, to talk uh, much about, about uh, the, other, the other issues we are, just, we are uh, all familiar with. What is this? What is this icon? Sorry? Caduceus, but this is not, not Asclepius, this is Hermes. This is the symbol of commerce. Do you see what I mean? Is there a subliminal issue behind? And uh, just a moment ago, this was published in the British Medical Journal. What are the risks of going into this Genomic sequencing for all, from this perspective. Every, each and every one of us becomes a patient. Uh, maybe uh, some of uh, people from my generation are familiar with Ivan Illich. Ivan Illich uh, wrote uh, uh, 45 years ago this book on Nemesis Medica, uh, and a paper in The Lancet in 1975 with a synthesis of the book. And uh, the, uh, the main idea that he, con that he tries to convey is that society, uh, a society which can reduce professional intervention to the minimum will provide the best conditions to health. The appro appropriation of knowledge by everyone. 45 years ago, we're moving right into that uh, direction, I believe. And uh, this uh, movement, Too Much Medicine, led by the British Medical Journal, is is, is, is uh, developed around the ideas of Ivan Illich, in fact. Uh, he, he would say that the medical establish, establishment has become a, maj, a major treat to health. Maybe we, are, we do not really agree with that, but we all would agree that increasing medical inputs will at some point become counterproductive and produce more harm than good. Do we want to keep developing increasingly expensive technologies or uh, that achieve marginal benefits or uh, we have to focus on the benefits that come with simple measures at, that have not been widely applied. From this perspective, the public health strategies for optimizing function from a life course perspective could be developed if we were able to identify the transition points which are yet uncertain because the nature of intervention changes through the life course, but we don't know exactly where to focus yet. We have some ideas, but still there is a, 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 a gap of knowledge, which is very important from that perspective that we have not been able to, to feel, uh, that we, on, on which we will have to work a lot. And the biggest area of opportunity and the hardest one is here, because we have, we have gained in longevity thanks to the uh, improvements in child uh, health and childhood mortality. But at older ages, progress is much less important and much, much, more, much more difficult to achieve. How can we integrate now seamlessly the public health perspective with the individual one? They should run in parallel for each and every one of us. And the possibility of gathering the, need, the information needed to do so is already there. We should focus uh, rather on quality of care, wellness, and, prevent it, and, prevent, and preventive care, and uh, value improved care quality 
and develop payment systems which are value-based rather than a fee for service. Probably that's uh, the tendency that is now being developed and uh, the one on which we should focus. Besides, the future of health will be driven by a digital transformation enabled by radically interoperable data and open secure platforms. As I do, many of you have this kind of watches, but I don't know if you would like to give your data to your insurance company. Eric Topol, who has written a wonderful book about uh, artificial intelligence in medicine, and in the last page, he summarizes the, the, his ideas in this paragraph. In fact, the idea is to work in three major issues. Deep phenotyping, yes. Deep learning, yes. And another rather surprising uh, emerging issue, deep empathy, what he calls deep empathy. What's the idea behind burnout today amongst the medical profession comes mainly from, from the interaction with the electronic health record and the time that you have to devote to this issue. If the resources of AI are directed into the uh, simplification of this and liberating the clinician for recovering the possibility of communicating with the other human being behind, uh, in front of him. That would be a major achievement. So, uh, yes, holistic individual data will enable personalization of highly specific plans and interventions. We will be able as well to uh, use future, future extraction algorithms to summarize data from the molecular to the public health level for an individual in particular. But still, we have to deal with, uh, well, we know what to do. We can tell people what to do, but how will we manage to be able to influence people in order to change behaviors? There is still uh, also there an enormous gap. How should we first, can we? The possibilities of artificial intelligence and other technological developments in healthcare are very uh, varied. And uh, indeed, uh, they are uh, so attractive. But I don't know if many of you saw this film. A dystopic future where only a few have access to longevity and healthcare. And in fact, this was uh, the film in Islam in around Mexico City. <laughs> The, 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 the difficult side. Uh, this, uh, the issue of inequity and how it could be uh, at a certain point, in, how, could, how it could at a certain point increase with uh, technological uh, development is something that we must keep thinking about. And OECD has uh, published a report in 2017 about preventing aging inequality. And I think uh, I agree uh, with uh, the, uh, the writers of this report that we have to work as well to prevent, to mitigate, and to cope with increasing inequalities at the same time. Finally, so uh, we have seven issues to deal with, self-care and consumer empowerment, keeping people's intrinsic capacity and function, De uh, developing integrated care in the right place and time, incorporating digital and uh, analytics into this uh, whole uh, issue to reconfigure the wor our work, develop a new system of outcomes-based funding, and promoting partnerships at every possible level. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Luis Miguel, and thanks for keeping up to time. Um, we now move to another continent and a very different perspective. 
Uh, Helen Schneider uh, has worked in, uh, at the School of Public Health at the University of Western Cape since 2011, has been the director from 2013 to 2016. And she's got a focus on uh, public health, health systems and, and policy, which I think is very relevant. So Helen, please. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone, and um, thanks for staying for our session. Um, I am a health policy and systems researcher in a school of public health. Um, I don't work on aging. I'm primarily interested in the problematics facing the South African health system, where I uh, was born and bred and have worked uh, for many years. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is really trying to synthesize some very simple high-level ideas of what I understand has, has been emerging, actually, in the last two days. Um, and starting off with, with what seems to me the, um, the essence of a future 21st century um, system of healthy longevity, so um, that's it summarized, okay? Um, and I think it is possible to deploy some ideas from public health and health systems from the 20th century, actually, even if one wants to reframe them and reimagine them in another way. So on the left-hand side, um, I think there's a pointer here. Oops. Okay, on the left-hand side, you have the life courses as the organizing idea. And in a future back perspective, that life course um, begins much earlier than, than aging. And in fact, one of the key messages that, that I go home with is, is the idea that aging um, is not about illness. It's actually fundamentally about health and well-being. That if one places prevention as at the center of the idea of healthy longevity, then the notions of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention for pub from public health have a lot of salience. Um, primary prevention would be about preventing um, or maintaining well-being and health. Secondary prevention would be early detection and, and reaction. And tertiary prevention would be about mitigating consequences. That would map onto a notion of, of levels, if you like, of a health system with community-based services and primary health care being the leading edge of a, a response in healthy longevity, but also providing comprehensive and seamless um, uh, referral and transitions into hospital care and after acute hospital care process of, of rehabilitation, which, by the way, I think has been a gap, actually, in the discussions and debates. Where I come from, people working in the field of rehabilitation are really driving the debates in these areas. And then systems of long-term care. Um, and then the expansive and new global idea of universal health coverage as providing the frame of universalism, solidarity, and equity that ensures the development of these integrated person-centered systems, that forms part of the sustainable development goals, which create an imperative to begin to think intersectorally. And what I've learned here is that one needs to think very carefully about the living environments um, in which aging is happening, the earning environments, and the learning environments, and the importance of creating um, forms of collaborative action across sectors. All of this underpinned by probably what is the most powerful set of ideas, it seems to me, emerging from this uh, meeting is, is the transformational values that encompass healthy longevity. Okay, so I'm just going to read what's on my screen. So firstly, um, the shift from the idea... Okay. Ah, it's come a bit loose. 
Yeah. The shift in the idea of aging as a burden to aging as an asset, the shift from the notion of dependency to one of rights and autonomy, a shift from a disease focus to a functioning focus, a shift from morbidity to wellness and well-being. So um, this simple framework um, um, could be unpacked in a lot more complexity. You could take each of those individual elements and you could open up a window um, that summarizes a rapidly emerging evidence base, biological, psychological, social, and economic, that can inform actually every single bit of, of that framework. And um, an evidence that I, as someone who's um, increasingly being offered pensioner discounts, um, I find very empowering and very hopeful. Um, so there's something incredibly positive about the framing of, of healthy longevity that I think will have wide appeal. Um, I think this idealized and perhaps slightly simple notion of a healthy longevity system bears absolutely no correspondence with our realities as we know them, unfortunately. And as has been pointed out extensively in this meeting, there are massive challenges to, to realize that frame, that set of ideas. The first rests at the level of ideas. We've spoken ex extensively about the mental models and the framings, um, the institutions, the regulatory processes that govern behavior, the norms, professional norms, the uh, prevailing cultures, and, and then the interests, all of those repre represent different forms of power that maintain the status quo. Where um, we've been in our school involved in, in trying to understand the unfolding policy process around the other end of the life course spectrum, the first thousand days. Um, and have come to understand how intractable actually some of these challenges are. They lie in the incredibly powerful biomedical framings that I think Peter Piot referred to earlier that um, still dominate a lot of thinking and programming um, and that seem to become the default. The bureaucratic logics, the kinds of stresses within sectors that keep people functioning in silos, that primary healthcare services and hospitals just do not have the mechanisms or the imagination to work with each other, never mind across, sector, across sectors, the absence of organizational forms and forums for people to get together, a kind of economic essentialism that tends to prevail, particularly when you get to country level. So, those incredible ideas of UHC, um, of, of solidarity, of equity, actually at country level become quite narrowed down to insurance arrangements, strategic purchasing, um, um, the creeping marketization of health services, um, value-based contracting that may in fact lead to greater fragmentation, all of those forces actually that um, where a, 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 there's fundamentally a loss of the broader vision that we're talking about. Um, a kind of, I think, excessive belief in the fourth industrial revolution and its ability to solve our problems. Um, so that those are the everyday realities that, that have to confront, actually, this healthy longevity movement. And we haven't even got to Trump, Brexit, and climate change. So it's, um, I think it's very important that we approach this with a sense of realism. And, and I think the panel before lunch, um, I think, laid it out brilliantly, actually, the, the kinds of approaches we need. Um, and I think that if we want to think about implementing, we have to think about where we start. And I would suggest that there are two ways of thinking about the problems um, that may help to begin to create 
um, the opportunity for the way forward. And that is to think about the healthy longevity system as a complex adaptive system. And secondly, to think about the challenge as a political one. Um, so complex adaptive systems are systems that have multiple interacting parts at macro, meso, micro levels. Uh, feedback loops are governed by the behavior of, of numerous actors that, be, that function in quite autonomous ways. They're governed by a lot of unpredictability. A constant set of inputs do not re result in a constant set of outputs. So um, levering change in, in complex adaptive systems um, is not going to um, uh, happen if we have a beautiful framework in, in the National Academy's roadmap report, a beautiful framework that assembles all the evidence. What's needed is, is um, something different and, and more than that. So levering change in complex, uh, complex adaptive systems, firstly, um, requires very, very compelling vision. So that is one key strategy in shaping behavior in, in complex systems to create uh, visions that people understand that enable widespread new mental models to emerge that then can direct the behaviors of large numbers of actors. Um, I think it requires um, not detailed blueprints, but what in the complex adaptive system language are referred to as core rules or simple rules of system. So what, what, is the key, what are the key actions required in this? Um, what are the key principles? And then to create mechanisms that enable local action to happen, um, that, that uh, govern, support, and enable, and resource properly um, local systems to unlock local capability networks, mobilize tacit knowledge, and get people to work together and innovate. So a lot of people have spoken about that. I think, so it's about how do you enable local action um, and not try and script it. Secondly, I think you need um, to consider questions of emergence and self-organization and how that works in the system. So I th an example in my own setting, um, in a rural village called Koa Koa, there's a, a radio journalist noticed that women, middle-aged and elderly women between 50 and mid-80s, loved watching soccer. Uh, they were all attending the local chronic disease clinic and been told they need to do more exercise. So she proposed that they start a soccer club. And so they, uh, in the face of much derision and, and ridicule, they actually got the soccer club going in this village. Um, the soccer club then was reported in the media. There was a documentary made. It inspired the development of um, granny soccer clubs all over the country. There's now a soccer granny's league in South Africa. And if there's time, I'll show you the video, but I think I'm using too much time already. Um, so how do you support that kind of emergence and self-organization and, and build and capitalize on it? The other, so then the last issue is really how to think politically about all of this. So uh, agendas get set, as Srinath Reddy said, is when you get a confluence of streams, okay, coming together. There's an evidence stream which is being created here, solutions, ideas. There's a problem stream, so a recognition a recognition of the crisis. And then there's a politics stream where there's, it comes to the attention of the policy process. And, and politics is very much about bringing those kinds of streams together. Um, and um, policy entrepreneurs, and I think we saw a great example in what Tina Wood was reporting, um, about how you begin to create the connections between those streams and, and you begin to build agendas. Um, 
I think that polit a politically aware approach would be very conscious of the need for collective action. So it's when people get together that change happens and political pressure is created. created. So you are busy creating a network on healthy aging. I think that's incredibly important. And there's plenty of evidence that epistemic knowledge networks have shaped global agendas. We've seen that, saw that in the Millennium Development Goals around maternal mortality, child health. Um, it's also about forming alliances at country level. Um, and I think in my setting, and also this has been referred to, if you want to look at rights-based activism, um, work with HIV communities, the first cohort of, of HIV-infected people now are in middle age. They are the people you need to draw on. The disability movement, is another one that I think where there's a lot of rights-based language that, and people who think in the same way that one could draw on. So I would say that, that um, being able to work with, with those kinds of developments and movements in a politically savvy way would be an important first step. And I think, have I taken all my time? So if you want to see the video, I've got it and it's here afterwards. Okay. Two minutes. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, please, can you get it going? Some of them were... Oh, no. Okay, it looks like it's not going to work. And I said show the video because it was interesting. Oh, here we go. No. Okay. All right, let's leave it. Uh, I said show the video because Sharon and I were having a discussion with somebody last night, I think it was Paul Irving, and uh, he said if you have a meeting for it to be successful, you have to have a song and dance at the beginning and a song and dance at the end. <laughs> and, and showing the video would have saved Sharon and I having to do the song and dance at the end, but unfortunately it looks like we're going to have to do it anyway. Okay, so, so we've, uh, we've started in, in the Americas, we've moved to Africa, and now we're going to come to, uh, to Asia. Our next speaker is Suman Kwan. Uh, Suman is Professor and former Dean of the School of Public Public Health at Seoul National University in uh, South Korea, but he also worked at the Asian Development Bank for several years uh, where he was the chief of the health sector group. And he has also uh, worked with WHO in the, as scientific and technical advisory committee member for the WHO Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research. So again, here he has this expertise in systems research, which I think is going to be very relevant as we move forward. So Suman, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me to this meeting. Well, I'm an economist by training, but I've been teaching at the School of Public Health for the last 25 years. So I re regard myself as an economist with uh, warm blood, <laughs> warm heart. You know, economists trust that the the invisible hand, invisible hand means the pricing and market system. So I believe in the invisible hand, but also I believe in the invisible heart, okay? Oh, well, I, I drafted this PPT and sent it to the organizer before I came to this meeting. So I, I, I do not aim to kind of synthesize what has been discussed in the meeting, but I found that Many of my views are well in, in, well in alignment with uh, those views expressed in, in the meeting. I'm interested not in not only the health, but happiness and well-being of all the people. So for, for well-being and happiness of all the people, I think there are three major components. First, health, so healthy aging is very important part. But these days, not only health, but long-term care is a very important component for the healthy aging. 
So we, we have a global consensus on the importance of UHC, but this UHC should be expanded, I mean, beyond healthcare toward long-term care as well. So there is one company, health and long-term care system. But it's also true that economic well-being is very important. Hmm? Better off, people with high income, they live longer, they, they are healthier. So economic income security is important, pension system, or labor market participation, are they all important? And, and at the same time, participation, community participation, social inclusion, though they are also important. And all these three components are interrelated. If you are not healthy, you cannot participate in, in labor, you cannot participate in, in community activities. But at the same time, participation in the economic, I mean, participation in labor, participation in community activities improves our health. So they are all interrelated. But I'm very happy that equity is well discussed in this meeting, because I think equity is a really important concept. And in, in an era of population aging, this is a major challenge, not just within country equity, you know, I'm working a lot on low and middle income countries, the huge inequity related with aging across countries. You know, in, in many high income countries, we are observing compression of mobility, but that's not the case. Probably that's not the case in people with a lower socioeconomic status, even in high income countries, and definitely not the case in low, in, in low income countries. And globally, there's increasing inequity in economic social resources. And even more, in the case of breakthrough, I mean, of course, there are many anti-cancer medicines with a very limited marginal value, but in the case of real uh, breakthrough medical technology, unequal access to this type of medical technology results in a huge inequity in health. We talk a lot about the social determinants of health. So that means inequity in the social determinants definitely leads to the inequity in, in health. And if you talk about life course approach, inequity in the childhood health have a lingering impact on the inequity in the health of all the people. And in this inequity in economic resources, of course, has an impact on the inequity in access and inequity in health. But there are many research showing that inequity itself harms the health and well-being of the population because it has a negative impact on the social capital, civil vitality, trust, and the investment in the public infrastructure. So we should really tackle with these inequity issues. At the same time, if you, if you really uh, trust these social determinants of health, the main challenge, another main challenge is a multi-sectoral approach. Because most of us in this room are working in the health sector, but health alone, health system alone cannot solve the problem. There should be coordination between health sector, social, finance, environment, labor, urban, pedestrian friendly urban design or pension system. They all, there should be a close coordination across different ministries. But even in the long-term care arena, in most Asian countries, long-term care is, is in the Ministry of Social Welfare, with the exception of Korea and Japan. So there's a huge fight, coordination failure among different ministries. So I just uh, already mentioned this uh, compression of mobility issues might be huge equity. Then I think, I mean, in this meeting, some people say there's important role for the private sector, I agree. But I think the role of the government is crucial. You know, market system is designed to improve the efficiency, not equity. We don't expect the private sector to improve equity, no. They have their own role. They can, they can in some, but that, that's not their major role. But one of the major tasks of the government to improve the equity. So we should really push the government, have a policy, not only to improve the overall level of health and well-being, but also at the same time, pay attention to 
to reduce the gap. There are many research, like for example, in the smoking cessation. If government implemented smoking cessation policy, who benefits more? Easily the higher income people, higher education people, who are more likely to quit smoking. So usually people with a higher socioeconomic status, they make better use of the government policy in a sense. So if the government does not have a clear sensitivity about these equity issues, oftentimes government's policy may end up with increasing the gap. So we should be very careful. In terms of financing, definitely private financing can never improve equity. So there's a global consensus that public financing, either taxation or monetary insurance, is necessary to ensure UHC or the universal access to long-term care. So also universal pension system, or at least government should have a basic pension for the poor. It's a very shame that Korea in Korea, the old people's suicide rate is the highest among OECD countries. Why is closely related with the poverty of, of old people? And also I did a research that after introducing the basic pension system and expanding the basic pension for the poor, there's a positive impact on health, decreasing the de depression of the old people in the case of Korea. Participation, we need aging in place. Also, we should change the paradigm of education. These days, you know, it's getting more and more difficult for old people to open a bank account, right? And they should use the electronic, whatever. They, they face difficulties. So we should provide some continuing education, community level education for them, and we should minimize social exclusion. And in that sense, I'd like to talk a bit more about long issue of long-term care. The coordination between long-term care and health care is so important. I think we all know that. Okay. Continue of care, we should overcome the discontinuity and fragmentation among, among service providers because currently, although we talk a lot about patient-centered, person-centered care, but healthcare system is, is designed for, perfectly from a provider perspective. We joke that if you go to the university hospital, there is doctor specializing only left eye, or other doctor specializing only right eye. I mean, it's a joke, but uh, this is a big problem. So to overcome this, we need a good primary care system. We need a good gatekeeping. But unfortunately, in the, in the case of, of Asian countries, in many Asian countries, this lack of gatekeeping or deterioration of primary care system is a big, big challenge. So I, I, this is, I say strongly that we should revise, it's time to revitalize primary care in an era of population aging. And there are many evidences showing that there's an interrelation between healthcare and long-term care. For example, if you do not have a good long-term care system, there's a huge increase in the social admissions, unnecessary admissions in acute care hospitals. And also quality long-term care improves the prevention, promotion, and increased, I mean, decreased the need for health care. So even from an equity, I mean, efficiency perspective, good long-term care system has a positive impact on, on health. A bit more on long-term care, why different spendings on, on long-term care in different countries. There are many factors like uh, population demographics, value, culture. I'm a I'm strong advocate of long-term care system financing in, in Asia these days. When I talk this issue to many Asian countries, low and middle income countries, they said, no, no, Asia, we have a still strong family value in Asia. But trust me, that it will very rapidly changing. In the case of Korea, my father was willing, of course, he was willing to care, take care of the parents. Me, I'm willing to pay, but I, I do not want to. <laughs> my son, he cannot understand what this kind of conversation means. And even if my son is willing to provide care, I don't want it because I know the quality of care is too low. <laughs> right? So it's a, it's a big, big change. But in the case of health care, especially Western welfare state, there are more of this homogeneity. Whereas in long-term care, there are huge heterogeneity in terms of eligibility rules. Still, even in the tax-based financing, sometimes Keep talking now, Victor. Yep. Yeah. 
So um, sometimes it's, it's, it's a, even in the tax-based financing in long term, there's a targeting system, difference in service coverage and cost sharing. And also there are some difference in health and long term care. But so as I mentioned earlier, if you are really serious about equity, we really need a public financing for long term care. Okay? There are two major types of public financing for long term care. One is a tax-based financing, okay, like Northern uh, welfare state, social, so-called social democratic welfare state, they, depend, they use this uh, tax-based financing. They usually depend on the public delivery system. And, but like countries like Scandinavia, there is universal coverage the entitlement, whereas other countries, they use a targeting. Targeting means the targeting based on the severity or functional status or income level or whether they live alone or not. And even in the case of uh, universal entitlement, the cost sharing can be depend, dependent on the income level. So they can use income-related cost sharing. Another alternative is a public in mandatory insurance for long-term care. That's the case Germany, Japan, and Korea. And they use this, in this case, insurance agency use the purchasing mechanism. And, but one of the major difference between health, mandatory health insurance and mandatory long-term care insurance is that this long-term care insurance, they have a formal assessment process. In other words, in healthcare, you just visit the doctor and you get the doctor get reimbursement later. But in the case of long-term care, you should first go through a formal assessment pro process. Okay? And the, one of the major difference between this mandatory insurance and tax-based approach is in this type, type of mandatory insurance, the eligibility is only based on need. They rarely use a targeting mechanism, with some exception in the Netherlands. And, but again, the difference between health care and long-term care is, uh, is in like, especially in the case of Germany, they use cash benefits. In other words, all the person has an option to get cash benefits and probably you pay this cash benefit to the family members or they, they rely on kind of formal caregivers. And in most cases, they have a ceiling on, on the benefits. So it, it, pro, pro, from a financing perspective, this long-term care insurance has a, some component of pension and some component of, of health insurance. But why different countries rely on different modality of, of long-term care financing? There's a path of dependency. There's very clear similarity between healthcare financing and long-term care financing. Like social democratic welfare state, they use tax-based financing for both healthcare and long-term care. In the case of Germany, Japan, and Korea, they have a mandatory insurance for healthcare and long-term care insurance. But of course, there's a difference in, in the generosity of benefits and eligibility. Finally, the governance issues. Again, there are some issues of equity. In the healthcare financing, there is a kind of global consensus, especially in the context of low and middle income countries, is that one payer, big centralized pool is more efficient and, equ and equitable. In a, in, a, in a decentralized healthcare financing, oftentimes inequity arises because different localities have different fiscal capacity and different groups are eligible, are, are eligible to different benefit packages. Some like formal sector government workers, they, can, they, they are el they're eligible to the more generous benefit packages. So in the healthcare financing, we always propose in the low and middle income countries, centralized pooling. However, there are some dif differences between healthcare and long-term care. Long-term care is a lot of a localized component. Okay? So in the case of long-term care, still local government and a bit of decentralized funding, decentralized system or community-based approach can work. So this is a bit of dilemma, I think. Okay? So there might be potential efficiency gain, but there might also some potential equity loss because if different localities have different fiscal capacity. And also the boundary between healthcare and long-term care is different in different countries. It depends on policy, culture, norms, many things. Like the case of the UK, NHS covers universal healthcare, whereas Social care, long-term care component is in, in, in the hands of uh, local government. In the case of Korea, we have a unified health insurance system. And this unified one single health insurer also covers long-term care. And then there's some kind of governance or disalignment issue along with the localized delivery system in the case of Korea.
Okay? But as I mentioned earlier, the most important consideration should be person-centeredness. Okay? Not to provide the centeredness. And also, as I mentioned earlier, inter-ministerial coordination is a big, big challenge in many Asian countries. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Suman. And another economist with heart. It's amazing, amazing what aging does to economists. Um, so uh, we, we're now coming very local. We're going to come to Singapore. Uh, and uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Wai Chong Ng. Um, Wai Chong is the medical director of the Hua Mei Center for Successful Aging and Secretary of Home Health Care Association and a member of the National Initiative for Care of the Elderly in Canada. So he has experience beyond uh, Singapore, but I think he's going to focus a lot uh, talking about the local experiences here. So. Okay, thanks, John, for the introduction, but that uh, bio was like 10 years old. So <laughs> now I'm 20 years into this um, area, and uh, so working in South Foundation the last 20 years and been fed with um, a lot of the principles and, and ideas from Jack and Rose, uh, MacArthur Foundation's um, Successful Aging Framework, and uh, Alex Kalache's um, Active Aging and the more current uh, John's um, Healthy Aging Framework. And based on those principles, as well as the person-centered care and all that, we have, um, I'd like to tell you a story of how we implement it. And it starts about 10 years ago. And uh, it was 2009 when we organized uh, the first Asian Forum on Aging. It was a combination of uh, IASA, the International Association of Housing and Services for Aging, as well as the long-term care in Chinese community started by Dr. Edward Leong from Hong Kong, and we sort of combined it and in Singapore. And Dr. Robin Stone was here. Hi. <laughs> we were singing uh, Forever Young in my car, I remember, on the way to Marianne's house. So um, she had this observation that uh, the housing in Singapore is actually very good for aging, and what we need is just services. And together, there was this um, concept that she put uh, together with ourselves, and then that was like put in the shelf because it was very ambitious, very aspirational. But that was really it planted the seed for the for Comsa. And um, somehow, two years later, um, there was something very interesting in Singapore where long-term care, social care, and everything on aging was placed under the Ministry for Health. And that the first project that I remember was, um, was something to do with City for All Ages. So that was the, um, the CFAA initiative from MOH. And since then, there were like four areas in Singapore that were mooted to, to experiment on age-friendly um, cities. And one of them was Wampo, and Mary Ann was uh, in the committee. And somehow we were roped in to help the local uh, people sector to develop um, the, the implement this city for all ages. And so in 2013, we embarked on this project. And because I got 13 slides, I have to be very fast. So um, that was like a 2013, the CFA committee, and we started this community screening and everything. And then three years later, they refurbished the the community club, and then we have got some infrastructure uh, where we can actually have some of our facilities. And uh, along the way, uh, and now last year, we have started this one-stop senior central at Komsa, where there's one line that anybody can, I mean, in Wampo can call for access to services. And uh, future back. So at the beginning, hearing all this very grand vision and also remembering what uh, um, the Asia Forum on Aging, what we talked about, and you know, Wampo and Singapore. So this was, uh, idea that we sort of have in Comsa. So this is a cartoon that I drew. Basically, in the housing flats, you know, in my own backyard. So some of them could be converted into assisted living. Some of them could be really skilled nursing facilities. What you really need is just trained manpower. And then we have that. You know, we've been doing this for the last 26 years. So uh, we've got a day center, Epic, which is modeled upon PACE that I heard uh, someone spoke about it. We were coached by Marie-Louise, none other than her. And then, uh, so we developed uh, a PACE equivalent and we provided home care all the way to end of life care for people with advanced dementia. So we thought that we knew what to do and then and we really knew, we thought, we really thought we knew what to do until we really embarked on the process. And then there was so much sweat and tears and, 
and maybe blood. And then, so I'm just sharing with you what, we, what happened in implementing. So when we started, there were all these principles and ideas. Of course, they are great, you know, proactive population health approach and then preventive intervention across the life course. That means you don't wait for a person to be a recurrent admitter to the hospital. You should actually identify people who are at risk. And we developed this very, very lofty way of screening for people at risk. And we emphasize on growth and resilience. And there's this focus on psycho, biopsychosocial model of health because um, uh, um, uh, Timothy Quill, uh, we invited to Singapore and he gave me this book called Biopsychosocial Model. And then I looked at it, it's really what we're trying to practice. And also Mary Ann's experience in America about the centrality of primary care. So we wanted to implement PCMH, Patient Centered Medical Home. And everything is only meaningful uh, and from our social worker, our CEO, who thinks that, um, Kim Chu, who thinks that it has to be systems. It has to be meaningful to the system. So it cannot be just good and only South Foundation can do. It's meaningless if it's done this way. So you have to make it into something that can be replicable, can be scaled. And this is a principle that we embarked on this COMSA. And uh, like what Dr. Fimber Martin said, you know, you have to find out what is the matter with you, but also at the same time, what matters to you. So this is about what matter, what is the matter with them. So we started with a community needs survey using Easy Care plus Lubin Social Network Scale plus the cognitive performance scale from Interi, and then we did like um, thousand over um, thousand three hundred and seventy five um, respondents to identify the issues that the community were experiencing, and to our surprise at that time it was a surprise because these results predates um professor um subramaniam and chong xiao an's report on the 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 prevalence of dementia is 10 percent cognitive impairment uh, positive and 53 percent were screened positive for lumen social network scale three percent feels threatened or harassed so there could be a risk of uh, elder abuse and this is a easy care question and then 36 percent were never married nine percent live alone and in some of the qualitative studies from our colleagues from social health school nearly one quarter may not seek help from a doctor even if they have to and this is what matters to them. And this, uh, this paper is not yet published. It's about to be published. It was done during 2014, 2015, done by our researchers from Social Health School. So among all these community surveys that came back, we wrote to 20 of them to want to do in-depth interviews. And only 168 allows us to do that. And when we knock on the door, only about 100 opens the doors. And when you actually interview them, only 40 allows us this in-depth interview. And this is the inner life of the older person. How do they perceive health? What is health to them? And based on the study, and it falls very neatly into Tom Timothy Quill's biopsychosocial. So they think the seniors regards health as about slowing down. And many of them feel they are aware of this walking slower and memory issues and so on, but they're accepting of it. And but they, they place a lot of importance on relationship in the family, in among the, even the sister's family or sister's-in-law's families, and then the spousal relationship, as well as financial strain. Financial strain weighs heavy on psychological health, whether there's adequacy, you can't see now, but you can listen to me, whether there's conflict in financial uh, distribution. And then, um, so that's psychological. For social, how do they perceive health? They regard health as about social connectedness, about being ability, able to share. Can I, can I cook for the family? And um, am I still needed by the family? And then eating together features very strongly in Singapore. I mean, we have among the respondents, there are about 70% are Chinese, 17, uh, 17% is Malays, and then about 10% or 12% is Indian and, um, and other races is the rest. So among this uh, multiracial community, eating together is very important as a feature of health. And not just that, that is the perception of health, but how do they manage? I mean, everybody, they don't need a doctor to maintain their health, but how do they maintain their health? For physical health, they talk about, I need to keep moving, I need to exercise, I need to eat healthy, I need to keep learning, including learning about social media. And then about psychological health, how do they cope with it? But they avoid the situation, they watch TVs, they, they distract themselves. And also some of them believe that they need to do good in order to feel good. So this is like, maybe the law of karma, and also some resort to power of prayer. So spiritual well-being features very strongly in self-management on psychological health and physical health. And then for social health, they talk about active particip participation. So based on these findings, what is the matter with you and what matters to you, 
this is how we mooted the idea of how we even begin to provide to create a city for all ages. So we have got already some programs that were at hand, like Healthy Lifestyle and Disease Prevention. We've got a program that started together with uh, Help Age International in one of the conferences in Bali about self-care on health for older persons. Older person coming together facilitated by a volunteer to learn about health and through the experience with another program that we have on financial security for women, we've realized that we, people coming together learn about something, they become friends and social capital is formed. And, but in order for them to really become a force of our own, we use guided autobiography, Professor James Barron, that we actually implemented in the 90s to sort of bring people out of the shelf and then started to build relationships and we formed the swings and become, this is to help in terms of self-management, but of course you cannot be just leave it to um, people on their own. We need to support because, because of all the tons of research and knowledge that's available in the world. So community need to come together. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, community, services, housing and infrastructure. And so um, based on the, the studies that we've done and some of the models that we have, so we started to build self-care and healthy aging lifestyle. So we outreach the community by organizing community parties at the housing blocks. Uh, there are nine precincts, so we have organized nine parties, reach out to them and form the scope group. So the self-care and health groups. And so the scope and then guided autobiography so that they become even more sticky. And then we build social capital by forming the swing group where they meet regularly in the gymnasium, in the community club. And then, uh, and then many of them were actually natural leaders. So we groom them to become champions. And and in order to address ageism and intergenerational solidarity, we used um, the schools like the SOTA, the School of the Arts, because that one um, was very imp I left an impression for me and Community Museum. So I then, uh, but that is the community development part. But we have to bring in the other part of the knowledge in the world. So community at the basis, we need to have primary care, and so that's Huami Clinic, based upon the patient-centered medical home models, where we have a very lofty ideals of the the various C's that Barbara Starfield talks about. And but it has to be supported by case management because the people we're dealing with are not just the any primary care users, are the very frail and vulnerable seniors. So you need care manager to link up with the rest of the communities. But this is not enough because people with dementia need special care. So we created a dementia care system. And people with intellectual disabilities who are aging, you know, their 40s is equivalent to 60s, and they're even older caregivers, you need a very good primary care with care management service to support them in a system that's connected with a long-term care service. So in our centre, um, since 2016, we've got this integrated home and daycare, which is a Singapore version of PACE, capitation in financing, but it doesn't cover hospitalization or nursing home placement, but still it has an incentive of um, providing pre preventive care. And this long-term care provides um, people with dementia and the rest uh, of uh, frail seniors. And uh, but of course, we all know it's not enough because health is biopsychosocial. If you can't, you can bring the horse to water, but you cannot make him drink. So you have to have behavioral health brought, bring in into the fold. And we have been having a team of counselors and coaches, health coaches for the last 10 years. And so we integrate into this particular program. But that's also not good enough. People need to keep learning. That's what the senior says. To stay healthy, they need to keep learning. And so this learning room, funded by the National Silver Academy, teaching people how, um, empowering them with knowledge so that they can age well in terms of participation, in terms of financial um, adequacy, in terms of um, health and self-care. And so these are some of the photographs I want to show you. The primary care started as a bomb shelter, only open two days a week, which is not a good primary care. It was the music room. And finally, in 2016, we got a place at the community club, thanks to the um, People's Association, the grassroots. And then it became, now it's running, it's very busy. And except for now, because of the coronavirus, it's not so busy now, but it's very busy. And then once every month, so everybody would gather and tweak the operation. Operations is no joke. It's, it's crazy. So, so we had to meet reg very regularly to talk about teamwork. And then at the third floor, we have our daycare center. This was before it's furnished in end of 2016. And then now it's furnished and it's full of activities. This was a cat therapy. It's actually just people bringing cats that are docile and don't bite. And this is durian. So now that you're in Singapore, you should have durians. It'll make you have joy in your heart. So, 
Um, but you have to integrate with the system. So in Singapore, we have got three um, health clusters. So one port is at the central. We are closest with Tan Tok Seng Hospital. So Tan Tok Seng Hospital is our close partner and we work very closely. And there are many things because of them that we can achieve, uh, include um, the free of uh, the, 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 the trans, I mean, the patient transfer, the transparency of medical records and also shared resources. And also with the lead of Tan Tok Seng Hospital and together with our own network among the community services, we um, created this uh, Novena Kalang Network and linking up with uh, um, the community network of seniors, which you heard Charlene talk about from APO. So this is integrating with the whole system. And the second last slide is about uh, the research. So we do research like mad. So because this is a complex intervention like uh, um, EK, you talk about, and also just now I heard somebody talking about, um, yes, Helen, that this is not a simple intervention. You cannot do RCT, you, it won't work. So we, we have to use a release evaluation uh, that was introduced to us by one of the professors who was from Social School of Public Health. And for the primary care, because we really believe that, for, especially for the very frail, you need good primary care. And we have got Dr. Wong Che Hui from Jerry, who is um, really uh, our partner in trying to find out whether it's cost effective, whether it hit the outcomes, and are we hitting the right target. And then uh, for dementia, we're working with Dr. Angelic Chan from Duke NUS just to see what are the need, burden of needs in dementia, and not just person with dementia but also the caregivers and also whether our intervention is it is it really valuable and based on the studies we can create a dementia inclusive community in one poll and the Comsa risk screener was one of the side products but it has got great impact because one of the thing about long-term care in the communities and in equity issues how do you identify people who are at risk and it cannot be just frailty screening hand grip strength and walking speed because as you can hear from the elders a lot of the health is psycho and social so we we, we use um, the data that we have and have this very very validated uh, screener tool called comes up at bps risk screener that can be used by a lay person like from tui um, the opas um, the older person associations the neighbors they can screen neighbors to identify who are at risk and and link them to the former system like the care managers. The Empower Studies we're doing with uh, Professor uh, Mohan Datta from Massey University just to see what it takes to, to, to create a social action from the seniors. And the Scope DM with Social School of Public Health is uh, people with diabetes learning about how to care for themselves. And the Qi Gong Ba Duan Jing, we work with Jerry to see how can it reverse frailty. The preliminary data shows that it's very promising. And we're also sharing in the sense that the BPS risk screener currently we're working with our friend from Ng Teng Hospital to see whether it works in a different community in Bukit Batok. And we are also a clinical training centre that are training community nurses. The last batch has just graduated last Friday. So conclusion, what makes COMSA, Community for Successful Aging, is self-development, community development, care system development, and evaluate it in a right way with infrastructure and neighbourhood. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I think we've had four really interesting presentations. I just want to delve down a little bit into each of them, um, particularly trying to think about What's the, what, what's the, how relevant are they for a global approach and a global attempt to change systems? Um, and I, I'd like to start with you, Helen. Uh, and I was really uh, attracted by your description of the need to leave a change in complex systems. And I, I, I noted that you said we need a compelling vision, uh, we need to have some core rules, and we need to have some mechanisms, and we need to enable, not script. I really, that, that resonates a lot with me, but I, I'm wondering how we go about that. Like, what, what's the next step if, if as a commission, we, we wanted to propose that sort of thing? What, how do you apply that to ageing and the issues we've been talking about? So, what I suppose I would start with this idea of healthy ageing and the way it's being formulated um, in this commission and to start looking at places um, where one can begin to assert it. So, you know, is there a campaign around the Human Capability Index, for example? Can one begin to tackle some of those um, unhelpful frameworks that have a lot of currency globally 
or how does one um, formulate it as, as a positive vision? How does one get a few key messages and, and begin to communicate that to actors in, in lots of different spaces? And for me, I, if there was one thing that I think, there was a question in the earlier panel, what would be one thing you could do? I think it would be to try and encapsulate that vision and start to communicate it very, very widely would be my starting point. Great, thank you. And, and Suman, um, I'm really glad that uh, you spoke on a lot on long-term care and uh, or social care, whatever we want to call it. And I, and I think it's really one of the things that I feel good about this meeting is that we really seem to have accepted that providing long-term care is part of healthy longevity. It's uh, that, that even if you've had significant losses of capacity, you have a right to healthy longevity as well, and, and whatever that means, it will be something different for you. But, but the models you talked about, you talked about financing, but it seemed very much you were financing either um, professional services in various forms, or you were financing to families. And one of the areas which seemed to be missing was what we heard about in one of the earlier presentations around community-based organisations and what we heard about here in Singapore about Wampoa. And, and, and I'm wondering if there's a, um, another financing mechanism which targets communities. And, and I say that because I'm a little bit worried that about perverse incentives and perverse consequences of some of the things we do. And you spoke about pensions, for example, prevent, uh, a chronologically a chronological age-based pension is inherently inequitable because well-off people live for longer. If it's a universal pension, they get more. So they're being subsidised by poor people who die. And, and, and I'm also aware that there are, there are some um, private companies which are looking at, at combining funding through pensions and funding through long-term long care. So my, my question to you is you, 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 you tended, I think, to focus on uh, service delivery or uh, support for ca cash to families, are there other models and, and are, there, are there ways potentially where we might be able to link that through pensions as well? I think in the context of uh, low and middle income countries, probably public pension or public assistance type of pension targeting the poor might be more feasible. That's it. And then the other issue is the issue of the benefit packages. Because usually the benefit package of long-term care financing does not necessarily cover only institutionalized care. It's institution, like long-term care provided by nursing home or long-term care facilities. But at the same time, there is an option of services provided by visitor, I mean, care providers visit home. So in that case, community-based organizations can play a role of a service provider at the community level. So it's the, the issue is, is not just the financing, I mean, what type of financing modality, but rather what kind of benefit packages we structure responding to the need of the population in the community. As far as I know, most uh, long-term care financing, like insurance, uh, Japan, Korea, or also other Germany and, and European tax-based financing as well, cover both institutionalized and home-based care, although there's a, some tendency or bias toward more institutional-based care. That's, that seems to be given higher priority, but I don't think that's right. We should cover both. Otherwise, as we mentioned, there is a bias toward a over-institutionalization. Excellent. Okay. Um, and Luis Miguel, both you and Helen, and, and it's been raised earlier in the, in the meeting, r focused on this issue of the, the biomedicalization of aging and, and the, the things we're talking about. Um, I'm wondering, because you, you identified the risk and the problems, but I didn't hear much about how, how we combat that. Could you perhaps go into a, a little bit about how we combat that? How, what, what, what should we be doing to fight, to push back against the biomedicalization of, of aging? Yes, in fact, it is, a, it is a big issue, and we uh, think uh, uh, from that perspective uh, that we should focus on the social and economic determinants of, of aging at the outset. And uh, Helen mentioned the first 1,000 days and how the impact of the 
improvement, the general well-being in, in, of the population at the, of those ages will have a significant impact later on uh, in, in, the, in the federal programming of, uh, of, of the aging process and, and how it will show up. So I think that uh, when we uh, focus our resources in the development of hospital services and highly uh, technified interventions in, in countries like Mexico, mid, low and middle income com countries, we uh, tend to, uh, to focus uh, the benefits on the higher uh, 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 income populations. And they are more probably exposed to the benefits of this, uh, of this interventions. Rather, uh, the, the issue of developing a social pension the, the idea of uh, developing a universal health coverage uh, for the basic, uh, uh, for the main uh, uh, health, uh, health issues will have a much more significant impact in the well-being of the population as a whole and the possibility of, of a healthy aging than uh, developing highly technified uh, uh, resources uh, and uh, that, that will not benefit uh, the, the whole uh, population. That is why I was uh, quoting, uh, quotating uh, Ivan Illich, this idea of uh, empowering the, the individual with the knowledge and the possibility of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, health literacy, uh, of reaching enough health literacy to be, to be uh, empowered to improve his, his own health. But still, we have the issue of persuading the, the population of the interest of, uh, of doing so. Uh, and that is a major issue. I mean, that's interesting because it also ties into to what Wei Chong was saying about facilitating self-management because it, it has two impacts and it has the benefit for the individual, but it actually helps to change the system. Uh, so, which I think is that's that's really neat, and so so Wai Chong, there, there were there were two questions I had for you. One was you said at the very beginning, just in passing, that um, long term care in Singapore came under the Ministry of Health, and I've, I've I mean I have a question about the governance and the leadership of all these things that we're talking about because we talk we're talking about so many different uh, areas, so many different disciplines. I, 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 what do you think is the best way of ensuring we, we have a coordinated response to ageing issues? That's, that's number one. And, um, and then the second one is that what you were saying was really inspiring and, and a, a fantastic model, but I'm just wondering how easy would it be to scale up in, in other places? Um, and uh, you know, you're, you're, you're a passionate person, you've got a passionate team. How, how feasible would it be for this to, to be rolled out more broadly? So the first question, um, how do we coordinate all the care and so on? I don't think we have the answer, but I just share with you what I observe as a citizen of what the Singapore government is doing. Charlene was here yesterday. It was around 2013, I mean, for, since the late 80s or the early 90s, that Singapore has this inter-ministerial committee on ageing. And for a long time, there is a minister in charge of ageing. I mean, uh, I, I don't know whether people remember Minister Lim Boon Heng. So, but, uh, but only 2011, that this Minister for Aging became the Minister for Health. And then all the various functions, the, the Minister of Health, the Aging Planning Office became the Secretariat to coordinate all the various um, uh, work related to aging. And there were four ministries in, um, directly involved. The Minister for Health was the Minister, well, Minister, minister in Charge of Housing, Minister for Social Welfare, and Minister in Charge, the, the uh, vice minister actually in charge of manpower they're all within this team so the result that i could see was what uh, sms Medi uh, amy core talked about the blueprint for successful aging and uh, i mean the jury is still out whether singapore has it right whether we have clinched the the the, the model i'm not sure so how do they coordinate basically i mean with with it like this i could start to see that uh, the, the policy became a little bit more consistent and the hospital became less hospital-centric. It became their, their KPI, sort of, um, in order to keep people out of the hospital. And, and the hospitals were so forthcoming in supporting us working in the community as a result of that, I think. And, uh, and also the housing. If you're in Singapore, if you have the time, please visit Kampong Admiralty. The housing is really like in place to support aging. And, and many things in the, as I mentioned in passing, this, the SGO, the, the center for, I mean, the Singapore, the, the Silver Generation Office, 
uh, together with the Community Network for Seniors, which, um, which is like galvanizing all the people in Singapore to sort of identify people who are at risk so that we can befriend those who are lonely and link them to the care managers, those who are frail, and then keep them connected with one another. So there's a whole system approach to coordinate. So that is uh, my first answer. The second question you asked about replicability, I'll just say very uh, briefly, you can't replicate Komsa like this. We have, to, um, we have to learn what is the context and the mechanism that made it work. And that's where the value of the release evaluation come in. We have to see this work here because of what? Because, and then if I want to replicate it there, how should I modify? What are the lessons here? And what are the things I need to identify there? And then to do it. So in the end, you won't replicate Komsa, but what you know is, well, somebody has done it, I'll do it this way, I'll check with them, they can mentor me, but I'll do it my way. I think this would be, the, be it. Excellent. Okay, so we've, we've got, oh, Marianne, do you want to say something? Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. since I'm from an architect of this thing, I think it's just replicable, but there's structure to it. Uh, basically, the whole Comsa Center has two pieces. One piece is actually a real center. It's really a cluster of services from primary care, self-care, um, long-term care, day center service, center-based service to, to end-of-life care in one cluster. And so that structure is replicable. How well we can replicate the Nagri with, with, with Wai Chong, you need to understand the context of that other community and understand what it takes to make that work by implementing that structure. The structure is, is replicable, but implementation requires some science, some study. And that one research, uh, that one piece of research called um, um, the uh, what's it called? I forgot. <laughs> you know, uh, with birds, what is that called now? Realist evaluation. Uh, thank you, realist evaluation. That method is actually useful to identify the soft qualities that makes things work or not work within a specific context. So I think there's, so that means that the comps are structured theory, the principle can apply, but how it manifests is adapted according to that environment. So in that regard, it's replicable for sure, but it requires not just, not just wholesale dropping in, you have to adapt it to a particular area. And, and that fact, I think, Sorry, I, I guess it's also dependent very much on, on the incredible infrastructure that's around it that Singapore has put in place, which would, may not be present in many place, other countries. Correct. I think that also community to community is different in terms of physical infrastructure, transportation, as well as service available. That's why you have to do some assessment um, okay. around what's available, what's not available in order to figure out how to adapt that model. Okay. So a question I just want to clarify, it's, it is uh, replicable, but it's not just you know, wholesale. It has to be adapted to the local environment. Okay, thank you. And, and thank you for now we're opening it up to the audience. Again, we're focusing here on systems and the action which we can start to take to move towards our future vision. So um, do we have some questions? It's Adelina, Adelina uh, from the LSE. I, I want to ask a very provocative question and I, I, it's a question that usually in the long-term care sector is not very appreciated, which is um, do we really need to have a separate financing system for health and for long-term care in an age where we know that most people that will need long-term care also have lots of chronic conditions? And if you are a, a country that doesn't have any long-term care system at all, is that a good time to separate it? Or is this a historical accident from the countries that aged in the 20th century that we don't need and a mistake that we don't need to replicate. And, uh, and, I, and I think in the Netherlands, it's very interesting that they have a separate financing system for acute and primary care, so be the curative care, and then another system for the long-term health, long-term care together. Just putting that thought out and inviting any comments. Excellent, we love provocative questions. So Suman, do you want to respond perhaps? Actually, um, I support the same system so I think the case of, well, I'm not sure, can see it's not. I, 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 the Germany, Japan, and Korea, we had a separate financing, although they are managed by the same agency, but different funding, different pocket. Why? I think it's similar uh, in those three countries because we learn each other. I mean, not, but Korea is a late follower, so we learn a lot from Germany and Japan. One key issue was that the strategic concern to reduce the potential over-medicalization of long-term care. In other words, preempt or reduce the potential dominance of medical profession 
in the era of long-term care. That was the major concern. I'm not sure whether it's correct or wrong, but as a result, maybe we, we are able to reduce the over-dominance of medical profession in the era of long-term care, but the cost side, negative side, is that coordination failure. So in a sense, the better way, I think, if I can design the system from the vacuum, from ground zero, if you have a good primary care system, I think, we don't have to really worry about this dominance of medicalization. But in the case of Germany, Korea, Japan, correct me if I'm wrong, we don't have a as good primary care system as the UK. So we are always worried about the dominance of not just a whole medical doctor, but specialist. So, but, but we are paying the cost, I think. So when I have a policy advice to low and middle income countries, I rarely suggest a separate funding. I, f I first ask, suggest them, please, you can extend the existing, in the case of health insurance, not the taxation, in the case of health insurance, why don't you extend the benefit package, existing benefit package a bit more toward long-term care, not, but not the domestic health side, but more like a long-term care for more serious, severe functional disabilities. And then see whether it works or not. So although Korea, Japan, Germany, we have a separate funding system, as, a, as an expert, I don't support that kind of separation from the beginning. Luis Miguel, did you want to say Yes, indeed, I wanted to react because, in fact, now with this new administration in, Mex in Mexico, we are focusing on the development for for 50 years, we have been uh, making uh, an effort in the development of the highly medicalized, uh, high specialty uh, 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 health uh, infrastructure. And, and we have neglected the primary care side. And now this new administration is focusing on the development of the primary care and, 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 and strengthening the primary care infrastructure. And at the same time, we are uh, planning the development uh, in fact, that we have been discussing recently in Mexico in October with Adelina this, this issue and uh, the, to, to work uh, simultaneously in a country where we do not have a long-term care system. So we have the opportunity of uh, begin by a community-based long-term care system linked to primary, uh, to primary care and then eventually develop institutional uh, institutions uh, for, for long-term care. But the issue of, uh, of over-medicalization, even uh, from this perspective, is still there and we have to be very, very careful about, uh, about this. So, so in essence, the healthy longevity agenda could actually be used to stimulate changes within primary care as uh, separate absolutely. to the healthy longevity Absolutely, agenda. absolutely. In fact, it, it could be the, the primary moments of the development of the, of the primary care uh, system. Now, uh, if we ambition as the, the last uh, 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 objective, the healthy longevity, I think that it's, it could be very attractive. Okay, did you want to say something else? Yeah, yeah. just to say in South Africa, the uh, impact of, of HIV created massive care needs, particularly in the first decade of the 2000s. And that gave rise to a very large infrastructure, first of, of home and community-based care, based on, on lay health workers, um, stipended lay health workers who eventually became community health workers, but also an infrastructure of, of residential care um, linked to that that initially served largely a palliative care function, but with the, um, the, with the uni a program of universal access to antiretroviral therapy, actually that the necessity for that infrastructure reduced and became reconfigured in, in quite a lot of places and in the province I work in, um, into a system of what we call intermediate care that serves a number of purposes to post-acute care, rehabilitation from strokes, um, uh, it still has a palliative care function that is not exactly very long-term care. So there's also systems of, of long-term care that are funded by the public sector, but that create this integration between primary health care, community-based, and, and the acute hospital system. 
and very strongly framed. I mean, you said, how do we get away from a biomedical perspective? So the, the group of people who were developing these policies came from a very strong rehabilitation focus. I mentioned that in my talk, that um, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech therapists, who naturally have a language of, of functioning, activity limitations, participation restrictions. I mean, and so they approach the design of these institutions from a functional perspective and with a very strong rehabilitation focus. And in fact, um, the development of a mid-level rehabilitation cadre to support these institutions. Wonderful. Okay, other questions, please. Yeah, uh, this is Paulin Basinga. Thank you very much. This is a fascinating uh, session. Really, we learn a lot from many, many countries, many continents. Great to see you, Alain, uh, after many, many years. Uh, this is Paulin. We did some work together in South Africa many years ago, 2003, I think. So one question to uh, probably to Korea or some others. You talked about the unified uh, health insurance scheme, which is better to really finance primary health care. So did you start by creating a one pool or you started by different pools to just bring them together? Because across Africa, we are really struggling to bring a unified pool. So any experience from either you know, Korea or Mexico, other places where you've been able to really you know, bring different pilots of community-based health insurance to create one national pool? We, Korea, in the case of Korea, we used to have a fragmented system that we used to have a more than 300 sickness funds in the country, and then we merged all of them into one. But I don't think this is feasible in other cases. Okay? I mean, immediately, I mean, this is a very immediate change in Korea. It, 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 at, at once, we merged all of them into one. Probably in other countries, you might <clears throat> have a more incremental approach. For example, in the case of Ghana, they started with these uh, community-based uh, small, small schemes. And at certain point, they merged all of them into one. And um, even if it is not, I, I strongly support the single payer system, but even if it is not a single payer, if you have like a Thailand, Thailand are three different systems, but it works reasonably well. So we should be, my, what, what I'm suggesting is that we may not have to be too ambitious. So we can, you can incrementally merge into a smaller number of schemes, but more important thing is that we do, should do our best to decrease the negative impact of fragmentation. If, if the multiple funds have the same benefit package, same payment system, it's not that bad. Okay? So our goal is that equity, but equity is not automatically achieved by simply merging all of them into one. That's my. Yes, uh, and in the case of Mexico, it's very similar to Thailand. I'm, uh, I, mean, I just come from Thailand. I was there the last week in, in the PMAC, and I, uh, I'm amazed by the similarities. And in fact, uh, in Mexico, we have exactly the same, uh, the same structure, three different uh, sources of uh, financing, the, the social security for the workers of the state, the social security for the private sector, and, uh, and the Seguro Popular, which is for those who do, do not have access to the to the uh, to the private sector who are in the informal sector and it's working now and, and we are moving in, in the same direction and strengthening the, the the universal health coverage through the the new institute for well-being that will uh, uh, strengthen the the former seguro popular excellent questions Ursula. thank you um, I just wanted to remind ourselves that um, the heading of this session I, I find very well chosen because it doesn't say health system, it says system of health and well-being. However, in our discussion we have now resorted to the more classical discussions of how do we finance a health system. And so I'd just like to bring back into the picture that a system of health and well-being, we should also strive to build a complex adaptive system that incorporates the world of work, uh, for instance, and the work of education to build uh, and to, to build the resources and maybe 
alongside a care system have a growth system of, of human capital. So I don't know how to build it in, but for the final report, I would find that tremendously important. And, and who would you make responsible? So I think there's no other way than on a political level to really advocate for moving beyond the silos of our established ministries. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's extremely difficult, but I don't see any other way. And otherwise, we will go back into our professions, the physicians with the physicians and the economists with the economists. And so to, to be disruptive, I, I think something has to be written in the report about that. Any responses? Nodding? Oh, you use yours. <laughs> um, so I, so the, maybe this is controversial, but I think the health sector is often not the best sector to lead on some of these things, okay? And in the first thousand days, and maybe also in, in healthy aging, um, social sector, social development may be best, better positioned to, to have the right kinds of mindsets to lead a response. And I agree with you that one needs a whole of government, whole of society approach, and that needs to be authorized politically at a very central level. Um, and again, I think there are emerging experiences actually of, of, of where that can happen. and, and actually how generative it is, that actually where you put the responsibility with the people who know how to do it and, and you give them the power to coordinate other actors, actually then the health sector might come on board if, if it's authorized from, from a central level. Um, but I think it's important that we don't always put doctors actually at the center of it. And, and there may be systems like the family you know, the family GPs in the UK that have a, a community orientation, but in many systems, it isn't the case. But, but I think what you, what you mentioned might also be important, that there's a higher political mandate. Okay. So uh, the, the, the then the health system has to pay attention as well. Um, Luis Miguel? Yes, I wanted to, to, uh, to bring your attention to another uh, Mexican experience which uh, was developed uh, 35 years ago and who came from the social development sector, in fact, uh, the, the program that was then called Solidarity and it was a co-responsibility program that with, within the, the social development ministry that uh, enabled uh, the families to, uh, to have access to uh, resources, to, to, to money, in fact, if they answer to a corresponsibility, going to the medical services, vaccinating the kids, uh, taking them to, to the school, and during the last 35 years, it has worked very well, helping to integrate the social and the medical uh, sector, but with the social sector leading, in fact. Excellent. I think we've got time for one more. John? Um, well, again, I, I really want to thank uh, the panel for a fantastic discussion. But again, expanding from what Ursula mentioned, because I think that this concept of well-being uh, does involve a sense of purpose and purposeful engagement. So, you know, Wai Chong, whether Huan Po is able to, to, to get something going, it could be either paid or unpaid. I think, Helen, you're, you know, soccer for grannies, that's unpaid, but uh, it gives people a sense of engagement and purpose. But I'm very interested in Sunman in, in Korea because of the elderly suicide. I mean, my understanding is that it's men especially because they have no social networks after they stop working. And how to keep those social networks going, especially for men, they are not as resilient as women when they, when, when they get disengaged. And Luis Miguel, whether Mexico is doing something along those lines. And John, I think the, 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 the people we should be addressing, I think is the Ministry of Finance, not the Ministry of Health. And if we think politically, I mean, I think, uh, Helen, you, you mentioned that, that this issue of, uh, of we need to frame this uh, um, uh, as aging as an asset. And I, I actually posit as an economic asset because you know, when people retire from the workforce, there's loss of expertise and the potential impact on GDP, even though we hate talking about GDP. Responses? 
Well, I, in fact, Judge, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. We have to, 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 to bring this issue to the, to the finance ministries. Uh, I think that in, in, in my case, when at the Institute we have been struggling with this for the last 20 years, and uh, finally, with this administration, we are talking with the Ministry of, of Finance about uh, the possibility of developing, and they are very interested in the possibility of developing in the long-term care system. But uh, I, I believe that at the end, uh, the responsibility to lead will will uh, will, will fall into into the social uh, development ministry. When the world will right. But I'd like to frame this not so much as a care issue, but actually as a work. You know, keeping them in the workforce, either paid or unpaid. Uh, so we we think of the people between 60 to 80 as a huge untapped resource, and how do we keep that resource and yes, if, engaged? In fact, we have three uh, three different uh, interrelated uh, issues that we do not always uh, have in mind, uh, and that uh, that play, that have an interplay, which are the the health financing, the long-term care financing, and pensions. And, and they are closely interrelated and interdependent. And if we were able to, to modify uh, the, the, the structure, as it has been uh, said by Ursula, uh, not this idea of uh, this continuous life course, but continuous work, uh, lifelong education, and, and private activities, that, that would certainly lead us into that uh, direction. But that is not an easy task. But we have to push it. Yes. Okay, we've, we've got time for one more. What about Jenny? Because I, I, it would be really nice to end on equity, and I know that's what you're going to talk about. <laughs> uh, I was, I was, I was going to end on equity, of course. Uh, I had a chance to speak to the Mexican uh, Minister for Finance about solidarity, and uh, because conditional cash transfer programs are potentially very stigmatizing, right? Um, and I asked him why, because there is some evidence that you don't need the conditions, that actually women will care for their children uh, if you give them the money, they spend the money in appropriate ways in general. Um, so, and he said they did it because it was, it was about the middle class. It was about, uh, it was prejudice against the poor, that if you give them cash, they will spend it irresponsibly. So the conditions were to get the, get the middle class on board, even though there was potential to stigmatize the poor. So, it, so an equity lens to that, I think, is quite, is quite an interesting one about, are there other ways of getting the middle class on board with social justice type initiatives rather than uh, approaches that actually result in, in stigmatization? And a similar point, really, to John's point, I think, there may be a risk here that um, we're constructing another kind of older person image, which is potentially going to feed another kind of ageism. That, we're, that, the, that this notion of, of uh, older people being an economic asset, older people being a source of revenue for the private sector to get the pension pots and to release equity from their homes. And if you can't do that or you don't do it, then you're actually potentially not succeeding in being this new kind of older person. You know? so, so I think this always having this equity lens is potentially quite, quite useful, really, and throws up issues that you might not uh, be aware of if you didn't do that. OK, well, I think that's been a fascinating session. And I think we should congratulate and thank our speakers. And, uh, and now it comes uh, to, to the final part of the, of the meeting where, um, as co-chairs uh, uh, Sharon and I will, will try and make some, some comments, um, we're not going to do the song and dance. You, if you've been worried about that, then, then you can relax. But I, I've actually found it, I, I, I've been to so many meetings over the last 10 years on this topic, and I've actually learned a lot from this one. So, so thank you all for your contributions. And I thought I'd just pick up a few themes which really resonated for me, um, and then Sharon will, will, will give you her sort of interpretation. So I think this issue of being careful not to medicalize this issue is really critical. And, and in doing that, what I've heard repeatedly across the two days are a couple of um, uh, different ways of framing the, the topic. And, and one is the capabilities model. 
Um, and uh, I, I think that's a nice way of actually avoiding this sort of issue of if we, if we take an economic perspective, it's a utilitarian perspective. I think a capabilities model gives us a more neutral uh, way, way of, of framing an economic case. Uh, so I think that's important. And then the other recurring thing that I, that I heard was a focus on functioning rather than disease. And, and I think that's a very useful way of helping us move from a medical model to a new way of thinking. Uh, so, and I think those two combined may provide a, a really nice platform for, for moving forward um, and, and then leading to a, a very person-centred response. And that ties in very nicely with the, the way the, the meeting is being framed. I think the, the, the second thing that struck me, and we haven't really talked about it, but people have raised the issue of the language we use. We've generally raised it, though, in terms of ageism and how the language we use can reinforce ageist perspectives. But I actually think we have to get our own house in order. And you know, I, as we talk about capabilities, capacities, functioning, uh, abilities, all of these things, and, and a, whole, a whole range of, of, of other terms, long-term care, I don't think we all mean the same thing when we use these terms. Uh, and I think it would be really nice to be able to move forward and clarify that so we're all speaking the same language. Because if we're not speaking the same language in this room, how are we going to convince the uh, economics people of, of, of our case? Um, and then that, of course, leads on to the absolutely fundamental issue of ageism. And we've heard repeatedly how ageism frames the way we look at the, 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 the topic of ageing, it frames the way we pose the, the, the questions, and it almost predetermines the research we do and the answers we get back. And so really trying to get to the root of ageism and changing the way we think about older people and, and ageing, I think is absolutely fundamental. Um, the, I think the issue of equity has repeatedly come up and trying to think about how we can avoid reinforcing inequities which become manifest in older age. So we see incredible diversity of, of circumstance and health status in older age, which has often been driven by the cumulative impact of inequities across people's lives. And yet many of the responses we put in place just reinforce those. And, and I think we have to be very careful that some of the things we might naturally think would be a good response will address that, but in fact they're making, they're reinforcing the problem. And so I, th I think we need to delve into that very, uh, a lot more deeply than perhaps has happened in the past. Th then I, what, what I also heard is the issue of human resources. And I think if you take a medical model, you tend to think about clinical resources, professional resources. Um, and then if you look at long-term care, we, we hear repeatedly about the importance of family. So including family as part of the human resources we're talking about. But I think what I also heard coming through is community and including that in the resources we need to be thinking about, including that in the resources we need to be supporting uh, if we really want to have an effective response. Um, we heard a lot about financing. I love what Suman had to say. Also liked uh, what David Canning had to say uh, very early on, where, where we're looking at risk sharing as a way of minimizing risk and, and, and equalizing it across the life course. And I think coming up with new models of risk sharing would be really, would be really helpful. Um, we, we've also tried to include perspectives from low, middle and high income countries. I, th I think we've heard a, a, a lot of, of a breadth of perspective, um, but I, I think we have to be careful that what works in one setting doesn't necessarily work in another. And that's even within countries at the same level of development. These responses need to be very context specific. But then what does that mean for the Commission's report? Because somehow we have to pull all this together in a coherent way. And the more you try and be context specific and, and, and modify the message for different settings, the harder it is to communicate. So I'm not sure how we're going to deal with that one. And then, and then um, I think also we've, we've heard a lot about integration, but I'm struggling with looking at the mechanisms for how we actually ensure all these things we're talking about are integrated. And you know, I do think, I agree that it probably the driver that is best placed outside the health system but how do you then integrate the changes in the health system? How do you integrate healthcare delivery with long-term care delivery and, and so on? I think, that, I think that's a challenge. And then uh, Jeanette Vega said something which I, I'd just like to close on and I think is really important. 
And, and that is, I think it's a risk for us, even as we're doing our future back approach, of basically projecting the present into the future and, uh, and, and sort of preordaining what is to happen uh, and trying to plan our response to enable that to happen. I think a, a, another way that we could be looking at this is how do we support the mechanisms which will allow the future to invent itself in a way that actually meets the, the needs which we're identifying. And it's a different way of thinking, and, and I, I'm, I'm not sure where that requires investment, but I, I, I think it might be a way of addressing that challenge of Jeanette. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to leave you and pass you on to Sharon, and uh, thank you for taking on my challenge for, for, for working. So. Thank you, everyone. It's amazing we've made it um, to this moment. So I am feeling very humbled by all the incredibly brilliant insights, the thinking that you've all shared with us, the work that you've done, how seriously you've taken this. I feel like if I could lock you all in this room, for maybe a month or two, we could really achieve something <laughs> together. <laughs> but I know that's uh, not feasible. I'm also feeling, though, awestruck about how big the job is ahead that we need to do and passing the responsibility to the commission to lead us forward. I think um, John summarized really well, amazingly, all the same <laughs> key messages I was going to um, say. But I also think that we've identified, you know, many, many gaps in our knowledge, in our evidence base, in our metrics, in our um, ability to translate what we already know into reality. And so I think that does really need to be a focus in how we move forward. I know we're transitioning to a next workshop in June, the one on science and technology. This one is, of course, extremely important, and we'll be moving to thinking about the basic science of aging, biology of aging, geroscience, of course, and the tremendous possibility for interventions against aging. I hope, too, though, that there will be a focus in that meeting on implementation science. I think so important and not something we really got to talk to in any great detail here, but so um, important. And Dr. Reddy was speaking about the different aspects of making sure we can operationalize, we can translate what we know um, into reality. And we need to do that with feasibility studies and with cost-effectiveness studies and with um, implement rigorous implementation science. I think you're also going to dive deep at that next workshop into technological innovations. And there's so much possibility there to do great good. And I think David Lindemann and also Tina Woods you know, laid the framework for us um, to think about the future. So as you know, the commission report will come in fall of 2020. We're really looking forward to that, but we know that it won't be perfect. It can't be because we don't know everything we need to know. But when that report does come out, I am really confident that it will lay a framework for priority areas that we've identified together that need to be addressed. And we come here from diverse communities from throughout the world. We've already identified themes that have come consistently across our six and one extra panel. Um, and that these can transcend boundaries to create a more equitable future, I think, for healthy longevity. I think our major risk for failing is inaction. This will be our main deterrent. I think if, you know, even if it's imperfect, even if our metrics are imperfect, even if we don't know how to do what we need to do, I think we need to do something together and we need to do it carefully and realize we need to iterate and improve as we go. 
but I think together we can make a huge difference. And we have the power, I think we have the will in this room to make that difference and to create the future that we need. So I'm issuing a call to action for all of us to magnify the effects of what the report lays out for us and to create synergy with other actions like the WHO Decade of Healthy Aging. So this is not just a discrete workshop, this is not just another report, but can be a focal point, a nidus for change that we can create together and I think we can influence this change. And I think working with the NAM, I think the commission can generate this roadmap and set targets, set goals for us to reach. It won't be perfect and we'll all realize that it's a work in progress, but we will need your help to accomplish that and to maximize the impact. And I know the NAM's report to Air is Human had you know, tremendous impact, and, but reports can only have impact when they're spread, you know, when the messages are spread, when they're brought to people who can influence um, and change policy, if it gets to the needed stakeholders, if it gets to those finance ministries, if the messages get out there to the people who can create the change. And so we need to do that. We need to get it before the people who need to hear it. There isn't anybody else. We need to use our spheres of influence to make that happen. And you need to get it also to your students, to your trainees. We need to reach across generations so that this message can carry on because it is going to benefit them as well. And so I'm going to challenge us, each of us, to spread it to 10 people, to 10 influential um, people who can spread the word, try to choose people who are influencers, who are amplifiers, the communications department at your key organizations, be very aspirational about this. And also we'll need to revisit this area in five years. Where's Victor? Um, we <laughs> this is not going to be a one-time deal, right? We're going to learn so much from doing this, and we'll have to revisit it. We'll have to be very agile. We'll have to adapt. Everybody is going to have to translate this in their local areas. As we already heard, all the change needs to be local. But I think together we can make this difference. We have to just start with that first step together and it's going to be the start of a great adventure. So thank you for being here, and I want to thank everyone again for doing this. Thank you to Singapore for hosting this meeting and to the planning committee for very hard work. To the commission, we wish you luck in your next big endeavor, and um, to CC and the, and the group for making this happen. So thank you so much. Please carry on. <laughs>